Jim, great to uh, connect, and welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks for having me. Looking forward to the conversation. All right, so this uh, index behind WTBN is the Bianco Research Fixed Income Total Return Index, and we're certainly going to uh, get into the mechanics of that, but I- I'm just curious, how did this all come together with uh, wisdom? We've been talking off and on for a couple of years about doing, and then finally in 2022, we made a commitment that we should move forward with this project, and we did, and as you pointed out, it, it finally came to fruition last month. All right, so with the uh, index, just explain the uh, problem you're attempting to uh, solve here. Like, as you look around at some of the other broader fixed income indices and ETFs in the marketplace, what did you see as the uh, shortcomings or potential areas of opportunity? Yeah, um, most people, when you talk about beating a passive index, think S&P 500. Think most people cannot do that because historically the S&P 500 is one of the better performing equity in, uh, uh, equity indexes, and that's true. But in fixed income land, it's not so much true. The index, a passive index, will usually come in around the middle of the pack, around the 50th percentile or so. Uh, and I think there's a lot of reasons for it, but the basic reason people understand the most is that equities, your all-stars tend to be your biggest weightings. And if you don't play those, you underperform. In fixed income, it tends to be your problem children that your biggest weightings, your overlevered companies or your countries that have borrowed too much debt. And if you avoid them, you can beat the index. So as I looked at the fixed income market in 22 and especially in 23 when we were doing this project and saying that interest rates were returning, there was an opportunity to manage an index's yield and to manage the index to not only capture that yield that it's giving you, because there's a yield again, but also to do better than just a passive index, um, knowing that at least historically the index was in the 50th percentile, not in the 90th like it was with equities. So that's what the construction of the Bianco Total Return Index is about. Is We're trying to say there's a yield in bonds. We want to grab that. And then we want to say that with some proper management techniques, we could enhance that yield by avoiding downturns in the market and maybe capturing some upturns with the cyclical moves in, in the bond market, understanding that in fixed income, it's a much different game than it is in equities. So talk a bit more about how exactly you're doing that. If, if we look at the index composition, what exactly is going on underneath the uh, hood here? So it's a broad, the Bianco Fixed Income Total Return Index it's a long-only index in broad-based investment grade. So it's very similar to the broad-based investment grade indexes that you would see in fixed income land. And that's our benchmark. Um, we've identified five what you would prefer to or I would refer to as factors that um, lead to the outperformance of an index. Duration, whether or not you're long your index on duration or short your index, which is are you – more or less sensitive to the movements of interest rates. The shape, uh, how you own that duration, or the shape of the yield curve. Is your duration owned between the five and the seven year maturities, or is it owned between the two and the 30 year maturities? Being one being bulleted, the other being barbelled. Bulleted would be because you think the yield curve is going to steepen, or barbell means it's going to flatten. Credit, are you overweight or underweight? Credit would be the third factor. Structure or volatility, which would be more people understand as mortgage securities. Are you overweight or underweight? Structure or volatility. And then we have a, a final um, factor that we've added, and that is a conviction or an other factor. It's a high yield, preferred, municipals, in, um, international, uh, and the like, as to whether or not you want to uh, uh, have some kind of conviction bet which in our index is only limited to a maximum of 20% of the overall index. So we reweight, we reweight these five factors every month to try and position ourselves to outperform, say, a passive broad-based uh, investment grade index. If I look at the current top constituents in the index, and, and, and actually let me just go through these. I think this might be helpful for listeners uh, if, if you'll bear with me. So 
Top holding is the iShares MBS ETF at 21%. That's followed, uh, followed by the iShares zero uh, to five year tips bond ETF at 20%. And then uh, just quickly here, Vanguard long term corporate bond ETF, Wisdom Tree floating rate treasury fund, Vanguard short term corporate bond uh, ETF, Vanguard intermediate term corporate bond ETF, Schwab long term U.S. Treasury ETF, Schwab short term U.S. Treasury ETF iShares 7 to 10-year Treasury bond ETF, iShares triple B-rated corporate bond ETF, and then the iShares 3 to 7-year Treasury bond ETF. Um, can you just talk about that that positioning overall? What, what should be some of the key takeaways if an advisor or an investor is looking at those holdings? And, and perhaps a good way to do this would be to compare to something like the Bloomberg U.S. Aggregate Bond Index, just, just at a high level. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, First of all, you'll notice from that description that we own other fixed income ETFs. The reason we do that is because the fixed income market, like the equity market, has now been sliced and diced into over 500 different um, index-based fixed income ETFs. So there's pretty much a flavor for anything you would want in the index land in bonds, like there is in stocks. So we could have put together, and we do have access to a cash market desk, if you will. We could have bought hundreds of mortgage securities. We could have bought MBB, which is what we wound up doing, to pretty much accomplish the same thing. So the first thing is we use other ETFs. That makes it very transparent. That makes it very liquid. Within the fixed income land, as I mentioned with our factors, you'll hear a lot of our factors in there, corporate bond ETFs, mortgage ETFs, Treasury ETFs, you heard, long-term, intermediate, short-term, whether or not we're structuring along the curve, how we, we structure all of these securities together, um, you, you know, to have an average duration. And the other thing about fixed income ETFs, the analytics have gotten so good in the last couple of years that while you might look at our portfolio and see 11 or 12 fixed income ETFs, we can actually track it as, 2,865 individual securities, looking at all of those securities, what are their average weightings versus various metrics, and compare it to a broad-based index that might have, like you mentioned, the Bloomberg Aggregate Index, that might have 12 or 13,000 securities in it, and to see how we stack up relative on our weightings on that. So we look at it as both not only a handful of ETFs, but an aggregation of thousands of fixed income securities purposely built to try and uh, uh, achieve an objective that we're, we're hoping to accomplish. Going back to your earlier point on the uh, potential shortcomings of traditional passive indices in the, in the fixed income arena, just out of curiosity, why not go pure active management here? Because as I'm sure you're aware, that's been a, uh, a, a huge growth area within the ETF space. There's been a lot of buzz around uh, active. And to, to what you were saying, I think some investors would, would certainly make the case that active management is much more effective in, in the fixed income arena than in the equity market. So, so why not just serve as the uh, active portfolio manager on this ETF? You know, that was a consideration. And when we decided to look at the possibilities that we could do. We thought that basically laying it out as an index was a better option for us in the way that we try to explain it, in the way that we try to move it. We, I, When I was explaining to the Wisdom Tree people how I, I go about doing this, it kind of became obvious that what I was describing was this you know, discretionarily index approach. So it kind of evolved more that that seemed to be the natural way to way to how we're going to do it. But you're right, we're not purely an active fixed income ETF. We're, WTBN is a tracker for my index, but my index is discretionarily managed. I use the word discretionarily because it's not mechanical. It's not a math equation like you're usually used to with a passive index. It's more of an active index. If you want an example, I like to think of, of how we do this. The S&P 500 is, an, is a committee-driven discretionary index. The committee gets together and decides which stocks are we going to take out of the index, which stocks are we going to put in the index, managed by human beings. Well, when we look at our factors, it's managed by my investment team. Uh, we, we human beings make these decisions in much the same way. 
Jim, just taking a uh, step back, I think a number of our listeners will certainly be familiar with you and, and your research. I, I've been tracking your research for years now. I feel like you produce some of the best commentary and charts out there. But I, I'd love to have you just tell listeners a little more about yourself and why you do believe you and, and your firm can add value in the fixed income uh, in indexing space. Yeah, so um, I've been doing this in the fixed income market and in the macro space for over 30 years. Bianco Research, my research firm, was founded in April of 1998, so we're coming up on our 26th anniversary. And I actually had 10 years before that, before I spun Bianco Research off into its um, own entity. I have been long a fixture since the 90s um, in the fixed income market as a commentator, as, an, as somebody who has been on the research selling side of the business for many years on the institutional side. I had gotten a lot of interest from retail investors and from wealth managers about accessing our institutional type of research a little bit more, and I thought a better way for me to provide that to that crowd was not just in the newsletter format, but was this index, the explanation of the index, why we have certain weightings, and an opportunity with a tracker ETF to invest directly uh, um, you know, uh, into our index and to see, uh, you know, to uh, move along with our index to make it very similar. So, you know, um, I have had very strong views over the last number of years, been very active on social media when it comes to talking about macro and fixed income. I think that's where a lot of people are most familiar with me, and hopefully they'll see this as kind of the natural extension of the business that I've been in for a couple of decades now. All right. So in terms of talking macro and fixed income, we have a few minutes left here with our remaining time. I, I'd love to just discuss the fixed income markets more broadly. And I, I think the way that I would set this up, Jim, is, you know, look, if we go back to 2022, obviously that was one of the worst years in history for broad bonds. Uh, last year was mixed, I would say. I, I think rates probably ran a little bit uh, higher than perhaps some investors were expecting, at least in the first two-thirds of the year. And then they did come back in a little. Uh, and, and then, you know, here more recently, we are again seeing, uh, I would say, some bias to the upside with, with rates. W where's your head at on interest rates and taking on duration risk in a portfolio right now? I think that's really the biggest challenge for a lot of uh, investors and advisors. You know, should they take on that duration risk? It is. That is the biggest risk. Um, and, you know, to be, to be blunt about it, and I've been very vocal on my views, I think that the bull market in bonds ended in 2020, and we're in a period of higher interest rates, or if you want to call it a bear market, yes. Now, why would I buy a long-only index if you were in a period of a bear market? Because in 2024, two things have happened. One, the big sell-off, as you mentioned, from 2022 – from August 2020 to October 2023, was the worst sell-off in the bond market from a total return perspective, price change plus coupon, since the Civil War. You have to, that was a 160-year uh, black swan event, how bad that was. Where we're left after that, we're finally left with a yield. The yield on broad-based bond indices now is around 4.7%, where it was around under 1% three years earlier. That yield can be managed properly to hold that 47 as much as you can, protect yourself from falling prices, and that would be to be short duration. Uh, so the management of a, of a bond portfolio, I think, has shifted in the last year or two to be something similar to the way we would do it pre-2009, pre-QE, when there was a yield. And one total return was an idea of there's a yield, let's grab that yield, let's now move our, our convictions or our, uh, our factors around that yield to try and protect that yield, maybe augment that yield by having certain moves. But you're right, 2022 and into almost the end of October of 23 was a horrible time for the bond market but with that sell-off. But when it was over... It left us with a yield, and that's what I think most bond investors are aware of, and that's why you've seen, even during that sell-off into 23, 
flows continuing into ETFs. People saw that there was a real, uh, a, a, a substantial yield, not to confuse with real yield, uh, and that they wanted that yield, but they also were risking price losses along the way. And that's what we're trying to say is we can hopefully manage those price losses. Plus, I would also throw in, we are in an inverted yield curve world. So this means that if you are short duration, you don't give up yield. If I move to become less sensitive to the movement of interest rates, which is what short duration means, so that prices don't fall as much when yields go up, I don't have to move down the yield curve spectrum if we had a normally shaped yield curve where long-term rates were higher than short-term rates. I could still get that same yield and um, and be less sensitive to the movements of rates. And that's why I think that this index factor approach is the right approach for this type of environment now, especially after the sell-off we saw from 2020 to 2023. Just about two minutes left here. What about on the credit side? Because to, to your point with where yields are at now, you may have some investors saying, hey, look, I'm, I'm going to try to enhance that yield by taking on some credit risk. And if I look at credit spreads right now, they are below the historical median. No, no, nothing appears too alarming, but uh, as I'm sure you're aware, certainly some investors are concerned about the economy and a potential recession. So just high level, what's your view on uh, credit risk right now? Credit, you know, your weighting in a bond portfolio in credit is your equity weighting. If you're overweighted your benchmark, to use an example like we approach it, you're basically making the same type of outlook that you would for rising stock prices. If you're underweight credit, you would be making the same bet that you would be if you were defensive in stocks. Um, our structure right now, I uh, should say, we're about 99% uh, credit weighting relative to our benchmark. In other words, it's a fancy way for me to say we're pretty neutral right now when it comes to credit. Um, we're, you know, reevaluating that credit issue right now in wake of stocks moving up as much as they have over the last month or so to try and figure out where we want to move, uh, change it. We haven't made a decision yet, but we're around 99%. So credit, I think, is your stock weighting. If you are moving into credit and saying, I want to grab extra yield through credit, then you also should be staring at the S&P saying, I think that's going to keep going up, even though it is currently at an all-time high right now. Not saying that's wrong. I'm saying, but those things tend to move together, and you have to – and it really shouldn't be separating them. Well, Jim, with that, uh, we're going to have to leave it there. Again, really enjoyed connecting. Uh, we'll, we'll certainly have to do this again. Best of luck to you on the uh, index and, and the ETF. Uh, thank you for joining me this week. Thank you. That was Jim Bianco, president and index manager at Bianco Research Advisors and also president of Bianco Research.